I'd like to introduce Hickey, OH7LZB, probably most traveled, right? Yep. Okay. Yeah, Tokyo, same place. <laughs> okay. Providing authenticated amateur radio services on the internet. Good morning. So, my name is Heikki Hannikainen, and uh, most hams call me Hessu, so you can do so too. And um, I run a website called APRS.fi, which some of you might have seen. And uh, thank you. And it's been a little hobby pro project of mine for the past six, seven years. And um, I'd like to talk to you about uh, providing uh, internet services to amateur radio operators only. And uh, that's a bit of a problem for me, how to figure out which of the visitors are actually hams. Um, most of the amateur radio services are like this here. Uh, they are reference databases, uh, docu document databases, uh, content to be read and consumed, and uh, for most of these sites, it's not a problem if non-hams see the content. And uh, some of the more interesting ones, at least to me, are the ones which allow you to communicate with other hams. And uh, those often end up keying up transmitters somewhere around the world. And uh, we'd like to do more of those. And a lot of the uh, new digital protocols have uh, text messaging of some sort. Those could be linked together, like Bob Bruninger likes to tell us. I I agree with him on that. And um, there's all sorts of dif different digital voice systems. And uh, some of those already have internet-based access. Some of those are have better authenticating than others. And um, some require you to buy uh, <coughs> dedicated hardware to, do, to get the access, which naturally limits the access to the, uh, the ones who want to go to a ham store and buy the hardware or something like that. And uh, SDR is the thing that is finally going into mainstream with really cheap, fun things like the uh, SDR dongles, uh, TV, TV receiver sticks, and uh, hack RF, which I'm looking forward to. And, uh, and also in the uh, larger audience of shortwave uh, DXers and contesters, it's now a popular sport to set up uh, remote HF stations at uh, your, either your country site location out of the city Q QRM and, uh, and even in different DX countries so you can operate operates uh, as a DX from, from your regular home location. And uh, actually, uh, some people have already started to rent access to these remote, remote HF locations in interesting contesting countries. But that might become a community thing to do also, that you could share access to to those transmitters, so any one of you could use my HF station and in exchange for you giving access to, giving me access to your HF station. And uh, we, as in me and my friends back home, we'd like to more, do more of these kinds of things. I, for example, I would like to make APRS.fi allow you to transmit APRS text messages and uh, I would like to be pretty sure that only hams can do it for the safety of the transmitting eye gate operators. And uh, we have linked VHF, UHF uh, voice repeaters. We could allow 
HAMS access to that. And uh, we would like to create mobile apps to do all of that. So, how does a website know if a website is there somehow, somewhere behind the internet is licensed or not? And uh, turns out some users are already ready to lie. We have bootleggers on the APRs networks. And uh, most of the time, there are not too many of them and they are not making a lot of noise, but, but they are there. And uh, usually they are not a big of, too big of a problem, but in some countries like France and uh, UK, for example, the uh, regulators are a bit more strict on some, some of these issues than yours or ours. So um, let's look at some of the approaches that are taken by different websites and services. Uh, Gearz.com lets existing, pre-existing users of the service add more. And then the new user can then add some more users and uh, all of those are considered as like trusted. It's a web of trust kind of thing that anyone can, can add more, more users. And, uh, and then if uh, something goes wrong, they just clean up the mess on the website. It's just a website. It's not a big thing if there's some bad information on the internet. It wouldn't be the first time. Um, <laughs> then, then again, if you are a new ham somewhere in, in some remote place and you don't have a friend, ham friend, who is already on gearset.com, you can ask them that, hey, could you please add, add them? And then there are some volunteers there that are, that are going to click the OK button for you. So uh, this is not a completely trusted system. Uh, some people have, um, quite many people actually have told me to set up a system where uh, an user comes on APRs.fi and enters their, their call sign, and then I check. I would check then automatically whether that call sign is on URC.com. Okay, that of course tells us that uh, that call sign is, dot, is on URC.com. I wouldn't be so sure, certain whether he is a ham, and uh, it doesn't tell anything whether that visitor on my website is that person owning that call sign. Okay, then there's um, the improved variation where my website would somehow ask for the user's qrz.com password. And um, then we would know that maybe that user is that person on URC.com, uh, but can you see any problems with that? <laughs> okay, the first one is of course that he might not be a ham, and second, uh, what if someone hacks my website? He would get all the URC.com uh, passwords after a while. Uh, what if I'm not trusted? I might steal URC.com passwords and you know, if we'd like to do this on more sites, then just, you would trust me probably, but the, all of the websites everywhere that they take good care of your passwords. No, no, no. And also if uh, that gearset.com website happens to be down when you want to log in, then you can't log in anywhere. That's bad. Uh, the APRS IS uh, system, which tr transports APRS packets over the internet has, has an interesting approach too, where um, there is an algorithm, kind of a checksum, which is calculated from your call sign. And uh, to be able to log into the service, you have to know that uh, secret number for your call sign. And the passcode is uh, constant, always for the given call sign. And the server simply checks whether you know your number. It's a, typically a five-digit number. And uh, if, you can't, if you don't know how to calculate 
that then you just ask your friend or uh, someone, the ASUS of the server you're connecting to, to calculate it for you. Or you find a website which does it for you. There are many, a few of those, and on GitHub you will find the source code for setting up such a web service that will just shell out the shell codes, the pass codes. And also on the bottom you will see the uh, Perl source code to calculate it for you. So everyone knows how to do it by now. Okay. It's not a good system. So once someone, uh, a non-ham, finds out the passcode for his call sign or her call sign, uh, there's no way we can take it away from the intruder. They will know it. We can't change the passcode. It's, it's a constant for the call sign. And this is also especially really bad if that person hijacks someone else's call sign and starts using it. We could block that call sign, but then the real owner of that call sign won't be able to use the service. That would suck. And everyone knows the algorithm by now, and the passcodes are short. They are, it's a 16-bit or 15-bit checksum, and uh, it takes literally seconds to guess if you write a simple script to try all of them. But it's not all bad. Any server somewhere can do the checking whether you know the passcode. It doesn't need to call up on some other service for that. So there's no single point of failure. You can use it on your local network without internet access. So something good in there. Then let's look at Echolink. Um, it varies by country what they do, but um, typically uh, Alice, our new user of the service uh, scans or photo takes a photograph of their license document and uh, uploads or faxes it to them. I saw a fax mas machine last week at an airport. They used it. It's very nostalgic. Yeah. Um, they, um, then they have an army of volunteers who check those license documents and uh, then allow you access. In the USA, I think they um, check your call sign against the FCC database and then somehow check that uh, you, you are a person who can, has access to that mailing address somehow. Okay, that's better, but still they need one army of volunteers if they have a lot of users on the service. And each service, like my service, their service needs one army to check the license documents. And it takes a while for the uh, new user to get access. Uh, Ecolink was really fast. It took a couple of minutes for me, so apparently the army is waiting there for the to, <laughs> new, new license to request to come in. And um, I'm not sure I could pro provide the same level of service and uh, it takes some effort for the user to register. And then again, you can fake documents, but still, they are quite simple paper documents. And, and uh, the document could be in the uh, Udmurt language, that's not Russian, Udmurt. And um, then, how do you check that's good? But for the big countries, when you start checking the licenses, you probably learn how they look for Google Translate, yeah. From a scanned document yeah. in Udmurt. <laughs> okay. So, but there's some right, rightness in this solution. Uh, it shifts the balance of work to the uh, attacker or the user. So the, uh, it's, uh, the new users need to do some work to get access. But for the uh, service provider, if they accidentally give access to someone who's not actually authorized, it's really easy to cut down access again. Just a flick of a switch somewhere. 
and uh, it takes uh, it might take a day to get access, but but it takes minutes to lose access. And that's probably going to take most attackers away. Then there's uh, ARRL runs a fine service called Logbook of the World, and they have gone the full blown X509 certificate way. And um, that's quite an impressive achievement. Uh, it it's good since it uses like off the shelf technology that's that's used everywhere on the internet, and it's really technically really strong. But it's the downside is that it's quite complicated, and uh, and uh, I'm gonna try to explain how that works if someone doesn't know it yet. And um, and uh, the uh, really impressive thing is that they have a huge amount of DXers and contesters doing the, all of that. So it's a rather popular service in like common hands, within common hands, not just like us, the digital folks. So it works so that the um, user of the service uses a client program, trusted QSL software to uh, create an RSA cryptographic uh, key pair. And then uh, the user submits a certificate request to ARRL uh, within the software. Then I, I scanned my uh, license and my photo ID, and uh, then I sent them in physical normal mail, snail mail, to the US, and uh, then waited a while, and it took a couple of weeks, then I got my certificates. And, uh, ARL checks the license and grants a um, electronically signed X509 certificate, digital certificate to me. And uh, that certificate then certifies that, hey, I'm Heikki Hannikainen, Oscar Hotel 7, Lima, Zulu, Bravo. And I'm from Finland. And, uh, and it says that ARL has checked my papers. And then I would in go and install that certificate. It came in email. I installed it uh, in my trusted USL software, and then I can use that to sign my USL logs and upload them to ARL. Uh, in the US, it's a little bit uh, simpler. I think they just send you a postcard in your uh, in your. Um, FCC registered email, uh, no, no physical mail address. And uh, that's, they t uh, make up a random digit number which is printed on the postcard. And when you receive that, you can type that number in on the ARL website. And then they know that you, the visitor on the website, is the person living at that address. And uh, probably, or someone in your family, but it's quite likely that it's, yeah, that it's you by, by that point. It's pretty good. And then they can grant you the certificate. Okay, there are some problems. It's even harder for me to get access. It takes two weeks for me, or some, or three. That's a long time to wait to get to this new hip service. And uh, it's pretty complicated. There's some cryptography and certificates and I think like four or five different passwords or passcodes which the end users can mix up and there are a lot of frustrated users out there, uh, not because of the certificate but because of the different passwords because they have a, uh, you might encrypt the RSA key with a password uh, so that if someone steals your uh, computer, uh, the keys are encrypted. That takes one, one password. Then there's a pass uh, the uh, password or PIN code on the postcard, which is different. Then there's a uh, uh, different password for the, their website. They don't use the certificates for the website access. They use a different password for that. And then uh, 
if you export the certificate, uh, make a backup of it on a file, then uh, that is again encrypted with possibly a different password that you pick up. And the certificate expire, expire every couple of years, but in this software there's a button to ask for a new one and you don't have to send in your papers again. But again, there are good things in it. There's even more, more work for the attacker. It takes a couple of weeks. And if you really want to get access to a, um, to a service, I guess you are ready to send in your license papers. And the really good thing is that the system uses industry standard X509 certificates, which are used in all internet software, all web browsers, uh, most email software can deal with it. And uh, they can be used to log into web services and they can be used to, if you install it in your web browser, uh, the web br browser can then use it to authenticate you on a website so the website knows who you are. And um, any third party such as my web service can technically do a cryptographic validation that a website visitor uh, possesses uh, one of these certificates and the private key, which is uh, that the, was, that was used to ask for the certificates. And uh, this is very strong. This is what banks use. It's good enough for us. There are some rumors that NSA has <clears throat> <laughs> done something, but uh, um, we are not probably so worried about this here in this case. And uh, if I use this certificate uh, authentication uh, on my website, I don't get access to your private key. Uh, if you authenticate on my website with the certificate, I don't get, gain knowledge of any of your passwords, so that I cannot, oh, I cannot go to other websites to log, log in as you. That's very good. And um, the ARRL doesn't need to do anything to let me do that sort of thing on my website. They don't have to provide any APIs or add more software or do any more work if my website tr starts to use ARRL's certificates for logging in. Um, ARL still need the army of volunteers to check for the licenses, or they are probably paid workers there, but anyway. But uh, those certificates can be used at any other site without making ARL doing any more work. And if ha more hams would be motivated to get these kinds of digital certificates from amateur radio certificate author authorities like the ARRL. Uh, individual programmers like myself could set up really cool ham services which, which uh, do proper license validation. And uh, this is the important thing, because most of these web services are actually run by one or two people, usually just one. And like my web service gets like 200,000 different visitors in a month. I'm not gonna check the licenses. That would be, it would be awfully boring. Um, and I trust there are more people in the world that would like to run these kind of services, but, and to allow access to hands, but it's, no, no. <laughs> and uh, a friend of mine, Javier, uh, um, knows someone from ARL and checked with the ARL guys and 
uh, they don't mind if they use the certificates. That doesn't matter since they can't do about anything technically. To anyway, we can do this without uh, technically without asking them. But anyway, they don't mind. And uh, it's well known that a lot of people don't want to uh, work with the ARL. It's just one league, and not everyone is a member. And but. It would be really nice if other organizations and clubs would set up CAs and start giving out these kinds of certificates. It's quite some work, but uh, maybe we could make it e easier by providing services that would help organizations to run CAs. For example, I'm starting to work with the, our Finnish local league to do just this. And also commercial companies could do, start doing it as well. I know um, uh, Georg Lukas, who is uh, uh, developing the APRS Droid, Android APRS ap application. Uh, he has done a, a license validation for a few years already, and he is, he is planning to start giving out certificates to those people. And I, on APRS.fi, will start trusting his certificates so that APRS Droid users can access my web service with his certificates. And also, uh, I'm working on an iOS application now for APRS.fi, and probably I will start checking certificates there, but then I will be giving out uh, digital certificates that APRS Droid can use. And uh, many hand clubs could start doing this, and. It could be a nice extra benefit for club members that become a member of our club, show us your license paper, uh, we assign you a certificate that you can uh, access these 20 websites on the internet as a ham. And uh, we have started working a bit on this. Actually, Echolink has been access ac accepting Logbook of the World certificates for 10 years already. They just don't make a lot of noise about it. Uh, our um, new APRSC, APRS IS software now currently has SSL support. So you can make an SSL encrypted connection to it. And uh, not for the uh, security and the uh, encryption part, but just because of getting the certificate authentication part. So you can use a uh, logbook of the world certificate instead of that passcode number to log in with your call sign. And we have a bunch of servers running it. And uh, the new version of APRS Droid includes client support for it. So you can drop in your uh, logbook of the world certificates in APRS Droid and connect to these servers without the passcode. And now uh, I'll try a little demo I can install this is not as easy as I talked. Uh, this is the preferences of Firefox. I go to advanced encryption view certificates. Oh. <laughs> I will import um, uh, this is my logbook of the world certificate. Uh, now it asks for me for the uh, master password or passphrase of Firefox that Firefox uses to protect my saved passwords and uh, certificates and private keys that I have loaded into Firefox. Good long password. And now it uses the <laughs> all, all asterisks. And uh, now it asks me for the password that was used to encrypt the file that I'm opening, the uh, P12 file. It's, I think, A is ASDF. OK, now it's imported. So now. Firefox is able to use uh, my 
ARL certificate. And uh, I have uh, set up a demo, demo site for this. And uh, for the first time, this uh, uh, Firefox asks me uh, which client certificate I would like to use, because I have a couple. And uh, it automatically is offering me the uh, trusted QSL user certificate from ARL. It, and it will remember the selection. Ta-da. And this uh, demo web page uh, shows some of the information that is in the certificate. And uh, that website is now pretty sure that I have a license or ARRL, ARRL has checked my papers. There's some propaganda in here. And if you want to set up one of these websites, and I have the configuration files on GitHub available for you. And actually, all of the authentication on this website is done by the Apache web server. Practically all of the web servers can do this, just by adding, adding configuration. So to do this on your web server, you don't have to write any code at all. But uh, then if you have some code running on the web server, you can, of course, uh, extract from the environment the uh, uh, contents of the certificate. So you can then grab the call sign from there and so on. End of demo. So what's next? Uh, we are trying to document this. How, how does it work and how you can use it this in your software? The hard part will be getting more CAs set up. Client software is easy since it's easy to use the SSL libraries and uh, HTTP client libraries in operating systems and programming environments. You just tell the client library that, hey, there's your certificate. Uh, the applications will need to have some UI to uh, to import the certificates. And uh, then we'll try to get more CAs set up so that we, would have, we, we wouldn't have to do it ourselves. I'm going to do it, but I wouldn't like to do it in a major scale. And uh, then we'll create some services. And of course, to get people to, to use these certificates, you have to have a good service that people are really interested in. So this, again, I'm sorry, this is a technical approach, but I think we have a problem that it, this can solve. I could try to tell you what is happening. How many of you, hands up, how, how many of you know how certificate authentication works? Oh, yeah. I might know. I, I'm not completely certain, but I'll try. <laughs> I did th this at the, the, the local club. It worked out. Um, most of people uh, think of uh, encryption as uh, when they think of encryption, they think of uh, symmetric encryption, where there is a single key which is used to do both encryption and decryption. And uh, the popular encryption algorithms that you are symmetric are listed below. Single key encrypts, decrypts. Both parties need to know, pre, have the pre-shared key to do encryption. And uh, you can use this for authentication if you have shared the key. Uh, a ser for example, a server can uh, come up with a random number, encrypt it with the key that it has, send you the encrypted uh, random number. You use the, the client uses the 
key to decrypt the random number and gives the random number back to the server. And then the server knows that, okay, this user has the same key. Okay, that works. Uh, but there are problems with that. Uh, the server has the client's key. And uh, when, some, when someone will eventually break into that server, uh, they will get all the keys and they can then go to other services to use those keys. And how do we securely exchange those keys originally? And so on. Then there's asymmetric cryptography, where the, for example, RSA and DSA. And um, uh, these work on a key pair. There's a private key and a public key. And the public key can be used to do encryption, and the private key uh, is then used for decryption. And from the private key, you cannot make up the public key. And the public key is really public. You can give it to anyone. I can give my public key to any one of you, and you can then use that to encrypt stuff. Uh, send it to me, and then with my private key, I, I can decrypt it. And you can use that for authentication, and that work, that is already pretty good. Um, the, uh, you put the public key on the server. The server, when you log in, the server encrypts a random number, sends it to me. I use my private key to decrypt it and give it back to the server. And uh, then the server knows that I have the corresponding private key. And uh, the public key can be stolen from the server, and it cannot be used to authenticate to other services. That's good. And you still have to distribute the public key to all of the servers. That's, that might be a lot of work. And uh, this is actually what SSH does. And it's widely used, works very well. Very well. The RSA algorithm can be used to uh, do digital signatures also. Uh, you make a checksum of some sort, uh, SHA-1 hash or something, of a document, and uh, sign uh, that private key, uh, or create a signature using your private key. And you can then send that signature together with the document or message and uh, someone else uh, who has your public key and knows for sure that this is your public key can then check the signature that this document is authentic, it has not been modified, and it has been signed by that person uh, who possesses that private key. And. Um, Then a certificate. This is how a certificate, a certificate looks, basically. Um, a certificate is simply a document, document which uh, contains information that the certificate authority is willing to say. Uh, for example, the ARRL certificate says that it has been the document that this certificate has been granted to this person having this call sign on this day. It's valid for two years. And this person's public key is this one here. And uh, they also con it contains the D DXCC country in there. And there's a digital signature on the bottom of the certificate uh, that has been done uh, with ARRLs uh, RSA key. So anyone who has uh, ARRL's public key can check the validity of this certificate. The whole, whole certificate document has a signature on the bottom. In the good old days, those used to be stamps or physical signatures, which handwritten signatures, which were supposed to be hard to forge. Uh, digital ones are really hard to forge. And uh, these do certificates are public documents. You can give it to anywhere. It's, it's not secret. I can give, give you my certificate. Uh, you cannot do much without it, since I'm not going to give you my private key. Uh, 
uh, those certificates can be revoked. The uh, certificate authority, like the ARRL, can publish a list of certificates that they want to revoke, take away from. For example, if they accidentally give out a, a certificate to someone who is not licensed, they can then announce that, oops, we want to take that certificate away, and, and uh, the services can then check against that list. And there's also an online checking protocol to do that. Currently, the ARL is not doing this technically, I think. I'm not aware of a CRL pr provided by them, but I hope they would start doing it, maybe. And also, uh, as a service provider, uh, I can start blocking certificates or call signs, or only I can, if I somehow detect that on my web service uh, there's someone abusing the service, I can uh, stop accepting that certificate only. And then that user needs to go and get a new certificate. And ARL might not be willing to give him a new certificate if they have also figured out that he's not a ham. Uh, they might have to go to another CA. It might take two, two weeks for them to get a new certificate. Uh, they might, uh, the abuser might have to even uh, make up a new call sign and get a new certificate for that if I block that call sign. So it's much more work for the attacker to do this. <coughs> Questions? We have one minute or two minutes. Yeah, it's Eric NY90 from Minnesota. I just want to say thank you, thank you for this. This solves a huge problem for us. We have. Um, ongoing credibility problems with our served agencies because they say, how do you authenticate your messages? How do you authenticate the user? So this fixes that, it's standards based, and then also it leverages, I think, the really the, the reputation of the ARRL, for example, as a trusted third party. So I, it, it just, I love it, thanks. Hecky, John, EI7IG. Just a question now, have you looked at using CA cert as a certificate authority? Not really, but why not? Um, we just need someone who looks at the our amateur radio documents. The reason I mention CA cert is that what they do is they, uh, they people are responsible, like I'm an assurer for, for Ireland, so I can, I can I, or for anywhere, but I, I'm based in Ireland, so I can check. Basically, I'm an assurer, I check somebody's driver's license, passport, whatever, then mm. I say to CA cert, I certify that they are who they claim to be. Mm. It's a distributed to a certain extent, yeah. But it's also, uh, it's, it's, it already exists uh, as a, as a yeah. CA. As a yeah. CA. I know about it. Yeah. Could, to, could look into it. Yeah. Hi. Uh, the certificates are definitely the right technical solution, but the process for getting them has to be drastically simplified. Yeah. Um, I did think up an idea for a much simpler system for authentication that's a lot easier to do. It's not as strong, but it might be more, a lot more convenient, quicker for people. Simply prove that you can transmit from somewhere in your, your, near your house. If you have an APRS transmitter, tell the person online to enter some kind of authenticator, transmit on APRS, you'll pick it up, you'll see where they are, and you'll know that that's probably the, the licensee. It's just an idea. Hmm? You can fake I APRS transmissions. Uh, no, you can do it on the internet, currently. Amateur, amateur radio networks, um, require not obscuring the content of your message. I'm curious if with your service, the SSL with your service and, uh, with, uh, APRSC, if it supports null cipher, so you can use the certificate authentication without encryption. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we can tune the SSL configuration to allow that, yes. Because uh, SSL, allow, yes, SSL allows you to select null encryption. So SSL without encryption of content, you just do the uh, authentication part. But of course, most web browsers refuse to do that for security reasons. But uh, if, you, we, if we start doing APRS applications, we can just tune the SSL configuration to do that. Currently it doesn't, but yeah. Okay, thank you.